In this video, we'll be doing a crash course on the built-in hooks that you see on the screen. This is Coding with Adam, and let's get to the code. When working with hooks, there's only a few rules to remember. The first is that all hooks will start with the word use. The second is that hooks should be called at the top level of your component. This should not be called in loops, conditions, or nested functions. And lastly, hooks can only be used within components or custom hooks. They cannot be called from regular JavaScript functions. We're going to start with the use state hook, and the use state hook is used to store state between renders of your component. For this counter component, the state that we want to store is a count. To use state, the first thing we're going to do is import use state from React. Then within our counter component, we're going to add use state. Now use state can take a default value in and we're going to pass zero. From use state, we're going to get an array. From that array, we can destructure two values. The first value will be our state and the second value will be a function that we can use to update that state. We'll then go ahead and display our count on the screen. Next, we'll go ahead and we'll add a button with an on click. The on click will call the set count function, which will increment the count by one. Calling set count will not only update the state, but cause the component to re render, updating the count value on the screen. Next up is the use effect hook. The use effect hook is tied to the lifecycle events of a component. It can be used to determine when a component has been initialized, and this happens once when a component is created. You can also use it to determine when a component has been unmounted or removed, and this also only happens once. And lastly, you can use the use effect to determine when there have been state updates, and this happens many times. Our example component is a to-do list. It has two pieces of state, a to-do list, and a completed to-do count. We'll start by using our use effect to determine when a component is being initialized. The first thing we'll do is import our use effect. Then we'll call use effect. We're going to pass in an arrow function. Our second argument will be a dependency list, and we're going to leave that empty, which will cause the use effect to only be called once when the component is being created. A common action you might do when initializing a component is to get some data. So in this example over here, we're going to be fetching our to do's and then updating our to do list. Next, we'll use use effect to capture the lifecycle event of when a component is unmounted or removed. In our example, when our component is created, we join a chat using chat API dot join chat. Now when the component is unmounted or removed, we'd like to leave the chat. The way we do this with use effect is we return a function from our use effect and that will be called when the component is unmounted or removed. Now all we have to do is simply call chat API dot leave chat so we can leave the chat when the component is removed. Well, lastly, we'll take a look at how we can handle state updates. We'll start by calling use effect and we'll pass in an arrow function. Inside this arrow function, we're going to call set completed to do count to update our to do count using the to do list. Now, we only want to call this when the to do list changes. So we're going to pass in an array that's going to be our dependency array. And we're going to include our to do list to only call this use effect when the to-do list changes. And that's how we can handle state updates. The next hook is use context. Let's understand context by understanding what it aims to solve. In this example over here, we have some state for a username. In order for our menu and welcome page and footer links to use it, we have to pass that information from the home page through various components down to the child component that will be using it. This is known as a practice called prop drilling. As we go from the home page, the header to the menu, the header doesn't really care about that property but forwards it along to the menu. To avoid prop drilling, we can use a context. A context is a global store of data. As you can see over here, our home page will set the username, and then the menu, welcome page, and footer links can access that global data from the username context. Now that we understand how context works, let's go ahead and apply this. We're going to create a new file called username context. We're going to import create context. We'll create a context called username context and export that. We'll then go to our home page where we'll import that context. Then around our div, we'll add the username context dot provider. So this context will be available to all of our children components and we'll set the value for our username context to Adam. 
We'll then jump to one of the children components, such as welcome page. On the welcome page, we're going to go ahead and import use context from React. Then we'll import our username context. We'll go ahead and call use context. We'll pass in the username context. From our use context, we'll get back our value, which is our username. We can then use our username in our JSX. The next hook is use reducer. Use reducer is similar to use state, but allows you to provide custom state logic. The way that most developers use it is very similar to the Redux pattern. We'll start by importing use reducer and then we'll call use reducer. Use reducer will take in two arguments. The first one is a reducer function where we can implement our custom state logic. The second value will be the initial value. Now for this application, we'll just be incrementing and decrementing account value and displaying it. So for our reducer, when we destructure the values, we're going to get account state and we're going to get a function called dispatch. Next, we'll go ahead and implement our reducer function. It's going to take in two parameters. One is the state, which is our count. The second one is the action, which will help us determine if we're incrementing or decrementing. Our switch statement will be used to check that type. If we don't find it, we'll throw an exception. If it's equal to increment, we're going to go ahead and increment the value. And all the reducer expects is that we return the new state value. We'll do the same thing for decrement and just minus from the count and return it. We can then go ahead and use our values returned from use reducer will display the count value and on our increment and decrement buttons we're going to add an on click that on click is going to call the dispatch method the dispatch method will take in the action and will either be passing in increment or decrement for the action type which will in turn call our reducer and update our state the next couple of hooks are considered performance hooks they help with performance by reducing the number of renders your application performs I caution you to only use them when you need them and after profiling your application. First up, we have use memo. Use memo can be used to cache the result of a function that is expensive to calculate. Let's use this demo component over here. It has a count state value and a password value. And when this component renders, it calls is password complex enough. And we'll pretend that this function over here is expensive and takes a little while to run. The issue with this component is that when we call set count, it's going to go ahead and force the component to re-render, which will check if the password is complex enough, even if the password hasn't changed. To resolve this, we can cache the value using use memo to do this we'll import use memo from react and then we're going to wrap the is password complex enough in use memo use memo takes in a dependency and we can pass in the password so it'll only execute this method if the password changes Use callback is very similar to use memo, except that we can memoize a function. To help us better understand this, we have the following example. We have a component called my use callback example. It has a dog count and a cat count, both of which are stored in state. We have a button to increment our dog count and a button to increment our cat count. And then we have a component called display number of cats memoized. As you can guess by the name, this component is special. If we scroll on down, you can see we're creating our display cat info over here. Now, the thing that we do extra is below where we memoize the component, which means that the component will only render if its properties change. From our parent component, we're only passing two properties in, the cat count, which should only change when we click the cats button. However, we are also passing in the update cat db. The issue is that if we click the dog button, it will force a re-render, which will recreate the update cat db function. Well, let's use the React profiler to help better illustrate this. We're going to start the profiler and click on the dogs button. Then we'll take a look at our result over here, and we can see that it's rendering the display cat info component when it should not be. To resolve this, we're going to use use callback. We're going to import use callback. Then we're going to go ahead and wrap our update cat db function with use callback. And we're going to give it a dependency. The dependency we're going to pass in is the cat count. So this function will only update when the cat count changes. 
Well, let's go ahead and confirm this with the profiler. We'll start to the profiler and we'll click on the dogs button again. And then you can see in our profiler over here, it is no longer rendering the display cat info. If we start our profiler again and we click on the cat button, we will then see that our display cat info is rendering as expected. Next up, we have use ref, and use ref is similar to use state in that you can store a value. Except when use ref changes, it does not cause a re render of the component. We can use use ref by importing it from React and then calling it within our component. We can pass a default value, we'll assign it to count ref. Then within our JSX, we can get its value by calling count ref dot current for its current value. To help illustrate this, we'll add a handle on click event and we'll increment our count ref and console log the value. Then we'll go ahead and we'll click the count button and we'll notice that it doesn't update the count value on the screen because it doesn't force a re-render of the component, but we do see the value updating in the console log. A more real world example is to create a ref that points to a DOM element, for example this input that we have on the screen. To attach our input ref to the input, we we add a ref attribute and make it equal to the input ref. We can then go ahead and use our input ref to access any properties or methods on our DOM element. For example, when this component first loads, we're going to go ahead and give focus to our input. Next up, we have use imperative handle. To use use imperative handle, we need to use use ref and forward ref. First, let's understand how forward ref works. We have a component called footer, and a footer has my button component, and that my button component has an HTML button on it. Now, what we would like to do is from our footer, we want to have a ref to that button. So from here, we build a button ref, we pass that button ref to my button, and then we have forward ref. With forward ref, we get a ref and we pass that ref to the button. Then from our parent component, we can access that button ref and call click on it. Let's say that we wanted to limit the methods and properties that we can access on the button ref. Well, in order to do this, we can use use imperative handle. Back to our my button, we can go ahead and import use imperative handle. We can also import use ref. We'll go ahead and create a button ref and we're going to assign that button ref to our button. Then we can go ahead and call our use imperative handle. We're going to pass in the ref that we got from the forward ref and then we have an arrow function. That arrow function will return an object with methods and properties that we can access on our button ref. So for example, we have a click so we can access our button ref dot current click and we have an inner HTML to access the inner HTML. Now these are going to be the only method and property that we can access from our footer. A real world example of this could be that you're building a library and you want your users to only access certain methods and properties on a ref that you're forwarding. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell.